Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hello, family. I'm Leslie, and I am an alcoholic. Oh, and I'm already about to cry. Okay. <laughs> okay, I'm over it. <laughs> oh, I'm a very grateful recovered alcoholic, I should say. And I'm also very grateful that so many of my friends came from up at Serenity uh, House in Newport, Georgia. And then friends from Nava. And oh, God, what a better way of life it is to be sober. Really? Hey, Kathy. <laughs> Um, tomorrow, I knew this was going to come up early, Terry Dunn and I, he spoke here a few weeks ago, well, it was May, I think, celebrate 12 years of being married, and, uh, wow, happy anniversary, Terry D. And we got married on July the 14th, which was the anniversary of my mother passing in 1996. And I knew that my mother would not want me to be morbid and sad and all of that on the day that she passed. And when we started talking about the day that we would get married, I uh, said, how about July 14th? And Terry said, okay. And then July 16th is my belly button birthday. So this year I will be, oh my God, I don't even want to say, but I will. I'll be 55 years old. I was born in July 16th, 1958. There was this little girl born in a town down in Hayville, Georgia. And my uh, brother used to love to point out that I was an accident. (laughs) Daddy forgot to stop by the (laughs) drugstore. I had two older brothers, and my oldest was 10 years older than I was. So around 1968, my brother was uh, coming home from Vietnam or going over to Vietnam. So around the time that I was about 13, he reminded me because I was trying to, I really don't remember my first drink. I don't remember what I did the first time. I think that he was right. I came out of the shoot an alcoholic. Um, my cousin told me when I was a knee high, you know, to a grasshopper, they would undress me to get me in the bathtub and I would run out the front door butt naked. That's how my drinking was. <laughs> Woo, doggy! My motto was live fast, die young, and leave a beautiful corpse. You know? And we were rocking and rolling and everything. And my brother came home from Vietnam. And one thing I do remember is he brought home a joint that was rolled in red, white, and blue papers like a flag. So I remember smoking that. I do remember when I was 16, I had a birthday party where I thought everybody was going to behave, and the word got out that I was having a birthday party, and everybody from the high school showed up. I don't think I drank that night because I was so busy trying to run around and round people up. Their parents heard what was going on. I was There were woods next door. I was running through the woods trying to find people and get them out there. Your mother's here. Your mother's here. The first drunk that I really, really remember was when my brother David, the older one, uh, got married, and we were in New Jersey, and they had this throne set up for the bride and the bridegroom, and me and the best man sat up there, and we were drinking champagne, and I and my father was sober at this point. My father drank when I was a kid, really bad, but I never noticed when Big Dave got sober, and all of a sudden, you know, he's sober. I know I didn't notice that. By this time, I had loathed him, and I blamed him, and I was already full of guilt and remorse, and I was a runner. If you got too close, I was gone. And so here we were, and I remember I kept stepping on that dress when I would try to stand up, and all of a sudden, my dad comes up, and he grabs my arm, and he's like, you know, we need to go outside and go for a walk. And I'm like, ooh, okay. And uh, he stood me in the lobby told me, you stand right there, don't move, and turn around and talk to somebody, and I stumbled, and I hit a bubblegum machine, and it mashed into the wall, and I turned as I saw a crack go all the way up, and boom, this big piece of glass fell, 
And my dad grabbed my arm and yanked me outside and was walking me in the parking lot and giving me that talk, you know, where you shouldn't drink, da 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 da, da. It was a talk we had many times after that. Um, I already should not have drank from the very first time that I ever picked up a drink. I was allergic to alcohol. I had an allergy of the body and an obsession of the mind. The minute I put a drink of alcohol in my system, I was not going to stop either until I ran out of money. Um, I still was working when I came here. So, like, I was working for the Atlanta Braves. Um, well, I don't know if I should have said that out loud. I worked for a major league baseball team <laughs> when I got sober. And uh, so we're going from 16 to 37, I think, when I got sober. All right. January 8, 1998 is my sobriety date. So from 16 to, I think it was 36 or 37. Countless vain attempts, just like we read tonight. Uh, countless vain attempts. Even my own father, who was a die-hard alcoholic, used to say to me, Leslie, you're not an alcoholic. Some people just shouldn't drink, and you're one of them. And I like that speaker that talks about the two little dudes that ride around on your shoulder. This one over here would say, see, even your own dad doesn't think you're an alcoholic. Come on, let's go. You know, and I would, like, for many years, I would stop drinking on New Year's Day, and I'd see how far I could go. I was very physically fit, you know, and all this stuff. And so I could do that most, you know, until I started getting older. I would, like, hit a bottom and then go, oh, can't do that again. And then, you know, stop drinking for a while. And then I'd, you know, get going, and I'd get back in school, or I'd get, you know, get a good job. And just about time everything started rolling along pretty good, dude over here would go, really wasn't that bad, was it? <laughs> this one would go, don't listen to him, don't listen, don't listen. And one day, I can remember several occasions when I lived over at Little Five Points, I came home from a jog, and dude said, you deserve a beer, and next thing you know, I'm drinking beer, you know, and smoking cigarettes, and headed again. My brother used to say, every bottom has a trap door. So once I would pick up that drink, I was off and running to my next bottom. And what I had to realize after countless vain attempts of trying to prove to myself that I could control and enjoy my drinking was that from the very first sip that I took, it wasn't the first drink that I took that did it. It was when I just said, you deserve to have a nice cold cocktail. So I would take that one glass and take one sip. And I was kind of a periodic. So I didn't immediately start drinking a fifth of Jack Daniels every day. But by the time I would hit my next bottom, I'd be doing all sorts of absurd stuff. Like it talks about in the big book, newcomers are often shocked when we burst into merriment over a seemingly tragic event. But why shouldn't we laugh? We have recovered from a seemingly hopeless state of mind and body is what I finally realized. That the nine inches between my ears are out to kill me. The most deadly thing that I've survived all those years out there drinking and using is standing here looking right at you. You beautiful family, you beautiful sober people. Because if I had had my way, instead of celebrating my 55th birthday day after tomorrow, I would be at Crest Lawn Cemetery right now, up on the hill, with Connie and Dave, <coughs> and my mom and dad, and I would have missed the last 15 and a half years of joy, of pain, of all kind, I mean, I can't even, oh my God. I was thinking I should write down all the stuff that has happened, but imagine the last 15 and a half years of your life. You know, I mean, life happens. You had said, ask for help. And by the way, you did a great job, Chris. Ask for help. There's a guy I used to love to listen to out in Los Angeles. We were talking about him in the hall. He's a limey, lush, and lovey from London. Thank, and his name is Mickey Bush. Thank God my parents didn't call me Harry. Can you imagine? That was very life. With a name like Harry Bush. <laughs> but he does acronyms through his whole story. And he says, ask for help. Ask Saving Kit for help. His ever-loving presence. And what do I get when I ask for help? I get hope. 
I hear other people's experience. So no matter what is going on, if it's a heart attack, if it's our house burning, if it's an illness, if it's the loss of my father, if it's uh, losing a huge bonus, I think the last time I was here was about three years ago and I shared my story and I had just had a heart attack behind, <sighs> there was so many things that happened like boom, 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 boom. and then my boss, whose wife had been recently been murdered, drop dead, uh, owing me a huge bonus. It was like the thing that was going to put me in Terry after years of paying off restitution and just trudging and sharing and being of service and doing this deal. And we were just about to get to that place where that one last little, whew, and we were going to breathe for the first time. And back then it was 12 years, uh, 10, 11, nine years at that point, right? This man dropped dead, owing me all this money, and I literally felt it. It was like somebody had just punched me in my heart. I just <gasps> felt it. And I ended up the next day at the emergency room, and I had a heart attack. What I did then was I jumped into service work, because you guys told me that the thing that would ensure immunity against another drink was intense work with another alcoholic. And I'm kind of jumping around, because I really don't need to go into... I've been hogtied, I've been pepper sprayed, <laughs> you know. I was hogtied on the anniversary of Rodney King being beat. I was carried like a sack of potatoes to the back seat of the Los Angeles Police Department, screaming, God, help me! You know, we forget all that. And he was helping me. That's the funny thing. That's how he helped. Like, boom, you know, like, you're going to hit me over the head with a baseball, boom. You know, you're down. Stay down. Don't get up. Stay down. <laughs> so that's what I have to do now. To stay down. Stay down. Stay down, Leslie. Stay down. <laughs> Woosa. This is my thing. Ooh. Okay. <laughs> so... Where was I? Okay. So I jumped into intensive work with other alcoholics. That was three years ago. And uh, there's been a real healing. Like just, just, just what, a month ago, on June 4th, we finally went to what they call a deposition. You know, and this program has taught me to be honest. My old sponsor used to say, one misty. If we, if we spelled the word honesty the way we pronounce it, the H is silent. It would be one misty. It has been a real dance for me the last three years to stay balanced. I am pretty high strung. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, and my husband, God love him, 12 years, and, and we started dating when I was a year sober. We, I waited a year because this last go round, I was going to do everything anybody had ever suggested because I had tried to get sober and drank and tried to get sober and drank and tried and drank. I even had three years at one point and spat in God's face. And he had really pulled me from the gates of insanity and death that time. And I chose to pick up a drink, right? After sitting and telling someone through dinner that I'm an alcoholic, and the next thing you know, I was sitting there with a glass of white wine in my hand. Dude saying, you never had a problem with white wine. You'll be all right. <laughs> <laughs> that was on January the 16th of 1992, and my next bottom was January the 8th of 1995. And by the grace of God and the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous and service work and, and the fellowship and just trudging the road, you know, no matter what, no matter what. So I'm like a chia pet. You put alcohol in me and <laughs> <laughs> a few days later, whoa! You know, I'm that little girl running out the door. Karen Garrison tickles me. She always says, I'm so loose when I came to AA, you could pat me on my head and my panties fell off. <laughs> she was one of my heroes when I used to listen to her. Sharon, Sharon Barker, she's got a different name now. You can Google these people on uh, in the room. But I love speaker tapes. I love Al Signs, Al S, who used to who used to sponsor Earl H. Al, I used to live out in California, and Al would say to me, Leslie, Leslie, come on, girl, get right here, come on, ready? Here comes one. 
Get, try to get between here, Leslie. You ready? Get between here. Come on. Here comes one. Now. Here comes one. Now. Rest your head on a now pillow, Leslie. Here comes one. Now. I can't tell you how many times I have seen Al S. sitting there telling me that, especially this last three years. And like I said, June of, June the 4th, we went to this thing called the deposition. For an alcoholic, you know, I, I, can't, I can't have any excuse. There's no, I just have to chin up, chest out, walk with as much grace and dignity as I can muster through. And I waited for three years for that day. And God's so funny because I started a new job that same day. And they allowed me to go to this thing and then show up for work. But four hours, they sat there and they grilled me. And you guys taught me just tell the truth. And that's all I did. And I don't know what will happen with that. I don't know if God will decide that, you know, it's time for Terry and I to be able to breathe a sigh of relief and take care of some business that had been, you know, put on the back burner or whatever. But the one thing that I do know, over the years down at NABA, some of y'all may remember that guy that used to, he always would talk about, you got me with the quickness. You got me with the quickness. <laughs> he would come up and he'd say, hey, Leslie, you got some money so I'll go buy a cheeseburger. <laughs> <laughs> and we didn't have two nickels to rub together. And I would look at Terry and I'd say, Terry, I, th I think I got a couple of dollars. Terry would say, well, I think I got three. And the thing that y'all have taught me is that I can't keep what I have until I give it away. So we would scrape it together and hand this guy what little bit we had and uh, go home and have a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. And there would seem like there was always a gallon of milk in the refrigerator, you know, or some ice cream, something special there. Because we had been willing to give what we had been so freely given. Because I am keenly aware today that if I had had my way on January the 8th of 1998, I wouldn't be standing here. As Sharon B. would say, you would have another speaker tonight because I would be dead. So no matter what happens to me today, one day at a time, I just get to, to me, it's like higher than any high I ever had. When I get through something that is painful, it's just the big book tells me that pain is the touchstone that spiritual growth. So today when I'm walking through something that isn't easy, I know, it's like, Perry and I say this too, God didn't drag us to shore, smush your face in the sand. Ah, uh. <laughs> <laughs> you know? He pulled me to shore so that I can walk through these things so that I can tell you that whatever is going on in your life right now is only temporary. And that there's something, they used to say that the light at the end of the tunnel now, to me, is not an oncoming train. It's the light at the end of the tunnel. And I know that when I come through, here's another one. I always talk about other people. Cindy used to say, we were born fighters. What is it, like 10 million sperm? You know? And they're all... Boom, two of them meet in there. And that's what formed me. Right? 999,000 of them went down the drain, right? And there's Leslie, the one that Daddy forgot to stop by the drugstore, right? Hey, poor me. If you had my miserable life, you'd drink too. Poor me, poor me, poor me another drink. <laughs> you know, they say, let me call you a wambulance. <laughs> <laughs> right? Right? So I don't, I don't get to do that today. I get to put my big girl panties on and walk with faith and dignity. And when I come through something like that on the other side, the reward is that I'm still here. I'm still kicking. If I pick up a drink, it's done. It's Katie bar the door. Terry and I have discussed this. If he picks up, my first thing I'm supposed to do is change the locks on the door. He shared here. Y'all heard his story back in May. It's immediately change the locks on the door. For him, it would be immediately take the keys away to the car because I'm a drunk driver. I'm the kind that has one too many, rolls the window down, puts an ice cube in her hand, and drives home like this. Right? Praying to God that I'm going to make it to the house. 
I'm endangering you, I'm endangering me, your children, your grandchildren, by getting behind the wheel of that car. I do not think about that when I'm sitting at that bar. Has anybody here ever sat at a bar and told people about the third step? <laughs> yeah, that third step's a bitch. <laughs> God, I offer myself to thee, build with me, and do with me as thou wilt. That's a, that's a wonderful step. <laughs> the time I got pepper spray right before my mother died I had convinced my father to let me go out and drink my father who said you're not an alcoholic you just shouldn't drink convinced him to take me out for a few cocktails and ended up getting asked to leave the bar and the manager came out and said to me don't you ever show your face around here again and I smarted off with something and the next thing I know they shut the door, and I'm thinking, you owe that man an amends. <laughs> <laughs> Head full of AA and a belly full of booze, as you've heard, do not mix. I opened the police door to tell the man I was sorry, at which point I felt my eyeballs go back like this because I was... <laughs> <laughs> and then hosed off in front of the Hateville Police Department with this group, a circle of cops standing around giggling at me, laughing at me, screaming at them, up yours, OP! <laughs> <laughs> Lovely. That was shortly before my mother died. And, I, and that was like really soon after I had picked up a drink. So I had another two years before I hit that next bottom of trying to control and enjoy it. So this isn't, as I, I say this, this is not fun and games with Dick and Jane around here. This program is a matter to me today of life and death. I had to retire from the debating society. I had to stop sitting in these rooms and comparing my insides with your outsides. I had to stop. I remember for years, I would hear someone say they tried to kill themselves, and I'd think, I'd never do that until January 8th, 1998, came along. I was a mascot for the Braves. I think I mentioned that then, and I had been injured. My neck had been injured. And I came home, and, you know, I was traveling around Georgia speaking to teenagers and children on how to hit a grand slam home run in the game of life. Woo -woo. Ah! Yes, stay in school and do your best. Read and keep up with current events and clapping and cheering. As soon as I park that van, I drive right around the corner and go to Dottie down there. And uh, I came home that night. My dad was mad. The last bar I drank in was called Serenity. <laughs> I remember when I walked in, ha, 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 serenity! <laughs> not long after I got there, they told me my uh, visa was not going to be accepted, and I smarted off, which is what I did. And then I was asked to leave, which I did. And I got home, and my father was angry because I was late with his car, and he was waiting to go to dinner with me. No one knew my dad. God, he was awesome. The man who I used to cuss and scream and tell him I hated him, it was all his fault. He died in our dining room with noble hair. You know, people in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous, a man who I hated, and I would have killed him if I'd had half a chance, died in our dining room. And that man right there took care of him for the last three years of his life while I was working out of town. That's the other thing. But, uh, God, I don't know. What was I talking about? Oh, when I've had that last drink at Serenity and I've pitched a fit, which is what I do, screaming and yelling and blaming at him, it's all your fault, I wish I was dead, and I went in the bedroom, and I, another thing I had said, I never hid alcohol. I couldn't be an alcoholic because I never hid alcohol. Didn't have to. Nobody was around that gave a rat's ass whether I was drinking or not because I pushed all of you away. That way I could do whatever I wanted to do. And I remember looking over, and I saw all these pills sitting there, and I thought, that's it. I'm done. I'm, I'm, <laughs> my life is miserable. <laughs> and I grabbed three bottles of pills, took them all, and guess what was behind the book? A hot beer. So a little miss, and I remember thinking, you always said you didn't hide alcohol. What's that? It was tough. So I took with a hot beer, and I had, I had enough thought to call a neighbor and tell her what I had done. I do not remember her arriving. 
I just remember falling and falling and falling and falling. And I just remember the lady, my dad calling me when I got out of ICU and saying, that's a woman coming from Georgia Regional to talk to you. You better be careful what you say. Because I still have my job. I'll we'll be back to work Tuesday. And this was like a Thursday. Whatever. And the lady walked in from Georgia Regional. And she didn't come across to see me. She walked in and she sat in a chair right by the door. And she looked at me and said, what are you doing here? And you guys kicked in. And I looked at her and I said, I used to be sober and things about Alcoholics Anonymous. And right this moment, I'm completely and totally separate from God. And I need to get back to AA. And she looked at me, started writing, tore this piece of paper off. She walked about six steps across the room and she handed it to me and said, I don't want to see you here again. And I looked down and it was the name of 3 AA meeting. It was Nava, the Biscayne Room, and I think Tara, there in Hayesville. And that feeling that Chris was talking about, just that, hey, this one is the bottom. Maybe this one is it. Please, God, let this be it. I'm tired. I can't do this anymore. And I did okay. I came home, slept a couple of days, and went back to work, and... Went and did my little thing and came back and turned in the van and turned in the keys to the van. Went over and got my little drunk BMW that had been from Los Angeles to, you know, all over with me. This little drunk car that when I'd go down a hill, smoke would come up in the back seat. I'm surprised I didn't. I took it in one time when I got my sober car. The guy, when I traded it in, was like, I'm surprised you didn't blow from here to smithereens because they had a gas leak in the back. I didn't even know it. They got in to test drive it, and they turned around, and he told me when I got my little sober car, when I was almost a year sober, he's like, I just want you to know that I almost didn't, uh, you you were not going to leave in that car because he opened the trunk, and there was like a puddle of gas. And I've been riding around and giving newcomers rides and smoking. <laughs> That's when I was rallying. Woo! Running around in my rally suit. But, uh, <laughs> I had a lot of fun. I liked running around in those suits because I could just sweat in there. I could just, yeah, full tilt boogie. And nobody could see me and they would hug me and they'd say, I love you, Scooby, or Rally, or I'd be like, I love you too. <laughs> Tears running down my face. But anyway, I drove from that stadium around to this seedy little bar, and I remember sitting there, and I remember knowing that if I got out of that car and I walked in that bar, that was it. I was done. And I'm sitting there, and I'm thinking, dear God, I had turned the little car off, and it had a clutch. And I'll never forget this. I'm looking at Dottie's, the back door to Dottie's, where, you know, the glasses tinkling in the cup, and the jovialness, the frivolity, and the laughter is calling my name. Come on. Come on, Leslie. Come on. And I grabbed that steering wheel, and I started saying that third step prayer that I, uh, God, I offer myself to thee to build with me and do with me as thou wilt. Please release me of the bondage of self, because that's what this thing is, the ism. You take away the alcohol from me. If the alcohol was the only problem, we would be having this meeting up here at Still Serena. But we take away the alcohol and left with the I, the self, and the me, the ism of the disease, or dis-ease. Please relieve me of the bondage of self that I may better do thy will. Please take away my difficulties, all that stuff. Leaving Los Angeles, leaving my career, my mother dying, whatever it was, was that I thought was a good enough excuse to go out there and do it my way. And you, please take away my difficulties. That victory over them may bear witness to those I might help of thy power, thy love, and thy way of life. May I do thy will always. Thank you, love, Leslie. Amen. And I started saying it over and 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 over. And all of a sudden, this hand was like wanting to grab that door and jump out. And this hand, I could, they were fighting. 
and this hand was wanting to reach down, and all of a sudden this one just reached down, and that foot popped off that clutch before I even turned that ignition, and wow, there it went, and boom, there went that little old 1974-2002 BMW, just right out of that parking lot. I could tell you where every pothole was in that parking lot. And I hit I-85 North, and I went to Nava, and I stood on a chair in the smoking room and said, I need help! <laughs> and everybody went, whoa, who's that? <laughs> I'm Leslie. Hi, y'all. Scooby, some people know me as Scooby. Some people know me as Rally. Psycho. <laughs> and Cindy helped me with that ticket, Sydney, so I know Leslie, that's crazy, Leslie. You know, where one girl came up to me one time after a meeting, she was like, you make me want to puke. I said, excuse me? She said, like, you're some kind of freaking AA cheerleader. Like, woo, AA! Happy Joy the Tree! You and your matchy matchy bag and your matchy matchy shoes. <laughs> <laughs> you're so enthusiastic. <laughs> and I went out to the car that day and I called Cindy. And Cindy was a big, big book thumper. She did the Wednesday night big book study at this cane room that I sat there. Terry and I both sat there week after week and I listened to her pour out her... She would say things like, Alcohol gave me wings, but it took away the sky. <laughs> She wrote in there, Leslie, you have the power to help people make their dreams come true. I never knew what that meant until today. When I was coming here, because I've been a little, this whole thing that I've been through, Terry can tell you, I've been, I've had the hardest time, and it's not that I've wanted to drink. It's just that I've had a hard time staying connected and believing and having faith. You know, I felt distant from my friends down here. I'm off up there. And there's a lot of people down here that really love me. And there's familiar meetings. And, you know, a lot of y'all, I know y'all, I love y'all. You know me. So I've just, there's, there's like from January until about two months ago, I really sunk into this. I used to go with a, to meet with a guy out in California that suffered from really serious depression, and I was beginning to think maybe that was what it was. And it really wasn't. It was just that I needed to go through what I was going through. I just needed to just breathe and just let God take the wheel. You know, you hear all high power. He says, I love that guy. Everybody knows this. Somebody right. talks about being in the boat and how, you know, God, like, at the helm, and I'm up there rolling, you know, doing my jet job and everything. And God lets me get at the helm every now and then. And I got the blue suit, you know, and the little cap and my little epaulets and everything. And I'm like, whoa, God, oh, I'm, at the, I'm at the helm. I'm driving this thing. And then I look around and we're not moving. <laughs> <laughs> because God doesn't row the boat. <laughs> I do. I am the agent, he is the principal, right? But it's okay, because I have to do that sometimes, and I have to be there until the other shoe drops, and then I go, oh, oh. I called my best friend, Margarita, we grew up next door to each other, and I said, I wish somebody had told me, don't quit five minutes before the miracle, can be three years? I mean, but now listen, in retrospect, I didn't even know this was happening until it was over. And all of a sudden, one day I woke up and I was like, I need to go get a job. Like, Terry's probably thinking, who is this woman and what did you do with my wife? Because for three years after that happened, I just piddled and did this and service and I worked here a little bit and worked there. And I didn't know what I wanted to do when I grew up. And one day we were sitting there talking and Terry said, what's something you did in the past that you enjoyed? And I said, I really enjoyed when I sold furniture. He 
well, why don't you try and do that again? And we were at lunch with his mom. I said, well, let's run over there. So we stopped by this little place, and I went in, and hi, I'm Leslie. And they're like, oh, two days later, I had an interview, and, you know, I'm in my fifth week there. And it's like, I'm a different person now. It's like, whatever was going on, it's like, done. Hi, and I'm coming back. I call it Hedda's out of Assis. <laughs> Y'all hear it before I do. It's not pretty. <laughs> you know, my old buddy says it's fear, frantic effort to appear recovered. I'm sober, I'm sober, I'm sober. Let me tell you how to stay sober. <laughs> Read pages 86, 87, and 88. Hit your knees every morning and every night. Oh, yeah, go to page 67. That resentment prayer is a really good one. God, please keep me from being angry. Meanwhile, I'm over here going, stupid motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I did it again. Last time I dropped the F-bomb, and I promised myself I wasn't going to do that. We're to church, Leslie. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> and I'm not Catholic. I just do that. But it feels good. <laughs> favorite pages of the book, right, is uh, the last couple of paragraphs on page 164. I think this is when Hedda started coming out of it. Was I was like busy doing all this service work and this old timer, anyway, looks at me and goes, you're just too steady. Like, Ugh. no, I'm not. And then I got home and I went, hmm, maybe there's something to that. Because in the last couple of paragraphs on page 164, it says, our book is meant to be suggestive only. We realize we know only a little. God will constantly disclose more to you and to us. This is the great fact for us. Abandon yourself to God as you understand God. Give freely of what you find and join us. Clear away the wreckage of your past. Um, I, I screwed, messed that up a little bit. Get really of what you, it says in there, clear away the records of the, talk about, obviously you cannot transmit something you haven't got. Right? That's when I sat down and I thought, what am I transmitting? Or as Cindy would say, are you carrying the message or are you carrying the mess? So I started thinking, hmm. I'm doing a good job. <laughs> so I started looking at my own stuff. I sat down, I did a 10th step, pages 86, 87, and 88, and I'm ever so grateful that Cindy T had me start doing those pages from the gate when I was new. She said, some people will tell you that you shouldn't uh, do those pages because you're new. She said, but honey, in there it said, being still in the experience and having just made conscious contact with God. So that tells me you can start doing those pages as soon as you hit the door. Because, see, if I walk in the door of Alcoholics Anonymous, virtually I have taken the first three steps or wouldn't be here, right? I have already admitted that I'm powerless over alcohol and that my life is unmanageable or wouldn't be there. I have already come to believe that a power greater than myself could restore me to sanity, which for, in the beginning was you guys, group of drunks. Good orderly direction. Get out, devil. Had some real God issues. So it was you guys, right? I've already admitted that my, I'm powerless over alcohol. I've already uh, come to believe that power greater myself could restore me to sin. That they would, it could, right? And I've already made a decision to turn my will and my life over to the care of God as we understood Him. That's you guys, right? So, but my my experience with the first three steps is this. I didn't work the first three steps. The first three steps worked me. From the time I was 14 till I was 36 or 7. Those countless vain attempts, those countless vain attempts, those countless vain attempts, those count, going back to insanity, the insanity, the insanity. Coming in here and saying, I'm not sane. Well, how insane is it to take a drink when I know full well that I'm allergic to alcohol? And that my life becomes unmanageable when I drink, and this thing over here can convince me, ah, you know, after being pepper sprayed, hog tied, you know, whatever, suicidal, never was homicidal yet. That's waiting for me, honey. <laughs> oh, I hope I don't.
don't drink. Oh. But, okay, so then we started on the fourth step. And I had the, the most, and I've done step work with Sid, but my intensive step work was with Cindy T. We went to the Colorama, and I will never forget, I had, you know, all the old, old four steps and journals and books and all these things that I had suppressed all these years. And we sat down, and they used to do Colorama up in um, um, Cashier. Cashier, North Carolina, and they're famous for their white squirrels. And Cindy had told me, I've never seen one of the white squirrels up here like this. And I was like, wow. So we did my four step, and it took hours because I got rid of all of that stuff about Miss Tear and Daddy. The, the same stuff that showed up in every four step got kicked off early and blah, 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 blah. I call it spitting in a spoon, right? You swallow all day long, all day long, all day long, all day long. You don't even think about it. But if I held out a big old teaspoon and I had you spit in it 20 or 30 times, and then I said, well, here now, swallow that, you probably wouldn't, right? So that's the stuff. That's the, when I see it on paper and I, I really look at it, and it's like I'm resentful at the cause and what it affected, and then the word fear alongside of it, and then I'm looking at what my part in it is, all of a sudden, the power, I realized that the power that these people had over me had the power to kill me. I am giving these people, what is it they say, me, me having a resentment against those people is like me taking poison and hoping that they're going to die. I had to be rid of this. We had to be rid of this stuff. Oh, get rid of it. Root and branch. Get that stuff out of here. It's just garbage. It has no power over me today. Come on, Leslie, right here. Come on, girl. Here comes the now pillow. Nah. <laughs> nah. Rest your head on your head. You know, or he's having a light a candle. Just watch the flame of the candle. He said, just five minutes. Just take five minutes to get connected. And I've had to go back to that, right? But that four step, and sure enough, as soon as we finished doing it, we walked out on the back porch and looked out over that beautiful lake, and there was a branch that went out over the lake, and laying on his back, getting the sun tan, was a big, fat, white squirrel. And you look, there's one of those little white squirrels. <laughs> And tears would just stream down my face because I was free of all that stuff finally. Oh, it's gone. And it has not had the power over me since then. All right? So it is that fifth. The sixth step, we're entirely ready to have God remove all of these defects of character. We had discussed my defects of character during that intense fifth step with her. And this was probably in the year 2001, I think, 2000, 2000, maybe 2001, when I was having all that problems with my neck. And oh my God, I walked around for months. With, I couldn't even think I hurt so bad. And then had surgery and everything. And then um, did the, my creator, I'm now willing that you should have all of me, good and bad. I'm now ready that you should remove from me every single defective character which stands in the way of my being useful to you and to my fellows. I ask that you watch over me and I go out from here to do your bidding. Amen. In the big book, it doesn't say amen after the end of the third step prayer. It says it after the end of the seventh. So it escapes to me that from the time I do the third, I need to get into action and do four, five, six, Seven. My eighth step came from my fourth step. I started going about making amends. Most of my amends were living amends because I really was a tornado through people's lives. I don't even, there's people who call me to this day, hey Leslie, how are you? I still have virtually the same phone number for years. You remember I met you in San Francisco? I'm like, I don't know who this person is. And I made tremendous impact on people. They loved me. They thought it was tons of fun. I guess so. They used to just like reach into a fire and pull out a piece of a stick and just start twirling a fire stick. 
crazy. I've jumped off the back of boat out in the middle of the lake and swam to shore. You know, probably had alligators in there. I don't care. Hitchhiked from Central Florida. When my dad worked for Delta, he was not supposed to fly unless you're dressed to the nine. I show up at the airport with shorts with my butt hanging out. Black guy where my boyfriend had punched me. You know? And my dad had to send clothes down so that I had something to wear on the airplane. This is the girl that I said was not, can't be an alcoholic. I didn't have holes in my trench coat and moss lying out of my beard. But then when I started, <laughs> when I started looking at that four, fifth, six, seven, eight, I started seeing my part in this stuff, you know, started making those amends. And then the magic of pages 86, 87, and 88, which I continue to do this, this to this day. Upon awakening, we review our plans for the day. When faced with indecision, we ask for an inspirational thought or idea. The answer will come if our own, this is the one, this is the one that started this. If our own house is in order, but obviously we cannot transmit something we think about. That's where the Eureka, Cindy would call it Eureka. When you find gold, right, they say Eureka. That was when I had my Eureka moment. I was like, ah, I'm trying to transmit something I haven't got. See to it that your relationship with him is right and great against the coming past of you and countless others. This is the great fact, though. But then you said, no, I'm mixing up two of them. But this is what I do. This is what I do. I have to, I remember once upon a time years ago when I started really studying the book, because I was an actor. I can memorize the script from beginning to end. I can memorize your part. I, I'm not, I, it's just the way my head works. But I can't remember your name. You can tell me your name and five minutes later I'm like, what? Kathy? No. Okay. But I can memorize. So I'm not trying to impress anybody, but I remember at one point thinking, you're getting brainwashed. And immediately, this voice said, you need to be brainwashed. <laughs> I had to replace the stinking thinking that goes on in my head with those words from that book. To this day, when I talk about having a conscious contact with God, I'm not just whistling Dixie. I'm not just saying that to hear myself talk. I literally have to have a conscious contact with God. When I'm driving to work, when I'm sitting talking, you know, over coffee with somebody, especially if we're doing step work or something, I'm trying to stay connected to that higher power. It's a conscious contact. We try to improve our conscious contact. That's 11, having had a spiritual awakening, 11, sorry, 12, um, thought through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God as we understood Him. So for me, it's not something I just pull out of my hat and, and you know, it's, it's not a 911 higher power anymore for me. Like today, I had a sale at work. And I'm walking back to the break room going, thank you, God, thank you, God, thank you, God, thank you, God, thank you, God. You know? Because I believe today to my airman self, if it weren't for him, I would be dead. And then number 12, having had a spiritual awakening as the result of these steps, we tried to carry this message to other alcoholics and to practice these principles in all our affairs, right? So there is, I have, this is another thing I had to learn recently. There is nothing that I can say to you that can stop you from picking up a drink. And there is nothing I can say to you that can make you pick up a drink. I'm just not that powerful. Or as Cindy would say, I had to retire from the general manager of the universe. <laughs> you know, what is is what ain't ain't. The only person I have any power over is me. And if there's something wrong, what is it? The other one, 449, 419, whatever edition you have, acceptance was the key. Whenever I find any person, place, situation, or thing unacceptable to me, I will find no serenity until I accept woo saw, woo saw. Snapping the rubber band, I'm over there, you know, I'm trudging, I'm like trying to get back into the middle of the bed because I finally figured out if I don't do the things you taught me to do, I will pick up a drink. And for me to drink is to die. And I don't want to die. I've had way too much fun. We get daughters that have been through college, you know, my God, what experiences we've had. 
in this past 12 years, Danny and Noble, and I mean, people that we've just recently met, none of you, I wouldn't, I wouldn't see you tonight. I don't know what, what the future brings. Like I talk, okay, it's time for me to wrap up. Cindy used to say everybody's life is like a patchwork quilt. It takes every patch in that quilt for it to be complete. So without something, whatever it was that went on, good, bad, or indifferent, that has happened in my past experience, my quilt would be incomplete. There's a little hole in there. She's talking about we all have a little piece of white velvet inside of us. That's my goal, is to nurture that little piece of white velvet. That's like the featured point of my little quilt. And that's where God is, right? In the meantime, I refer to it more like a book. Is it Life has these chapters to it. The, the first part of my book was kind of nuts, though, and I drank a lot, and I partied a lot, and I want to say I didn't have fun, but it was it was just slow and this. So it was kind of a waste of, of a really vibrant light that God had given me. And I sort of just took, took that for granted to, to some degree. I don't regret anything. I did have a lot of fun. In the meantime, now that I am sober, there's these chapters that come along now. You know, you read a book, like, ooh, you've got tears running down in that chapter, and then you flip the page and something has changed. It's kind of what I'm going through right now. I've just kind of flipped the page, and now it's like I'm excited again to see what is in store, you know? And I really am grateful to Eric for inviting me to come out and share. I don't know if y'all... I don't, I don't know. If, like they say, if one person got anything out of what I just shared, I'm good. Because I'm pretty sure I jumped around. I have a bad habit of doing that. But I love you guys. I love being sober. God, it's better than any high I ever had. I love you guys. And let's see what the next chapter brings for you, too. See, that's the beauty, is you have the power to make people's dreams come true. That's what she meant. That's what she meant. We all have that power. We can either go to the gates of insanity and death, or we can carry the message of hope. I can tell you, you don't have to live with sadness and all of that. Jeez, oh, Cromany, grab hold of AA. Get in here. Live your life to the fullest. Live your dreams. It may not be the dreams that you envisioned, but the plan is there. If I don't stay sober, I'm not going to find out how that book's going to end. I want to know. You know? Uh, I love you guys. Thank you for my sobriety and thank you for inviting me. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.